So welcome, good afternoon. Uh, this is House Judiciary and we are continuing our consideration of S-114 that we understand that the Senate Judiciary has uh, voted on, but not yet the Senate. Uh, we're trying to uh, get up to speed and understand, uh, understand it. And Judge, welcome. Uh, Thank and, you, Madam uh, Chair. Yeah, sure. And um, for those of you who are testifying today, uh, Representative Lalonde did send a, a memo with some of the committee's questions. So if you haven't had a chance to review that, I don't know if you can, but but we do have a number of, of questions based on just going through the walkthrough. So I will turn it over to you, Your Honor, right now. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the committee for inviting me. Uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge I have um, on another screen um, draft 3.2 of S114. Is that what everyone's looking at? I did not see a representative Alon's email. Um, did that just, was that sent not long ago? Uh, about 12.30, a little after 12.30. Let me see if I can find it. Probably didn't have any questions for me, right? Oh, no, not at all. Mm. Okay. So, um, how, how would, how would you like me to start by answering, trying to answer the questions or going through the bill? I th well, I think for some general background as to how my, my our understanding is that that the language came from the judiciary, and so um, so I think a, a just some background background why why these provisions are are needed uh, what <clears throat> what they would address. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the the bill, if you will, was probably started seems like a long time ago, but it was. Um, Pat Gable and myself were invited to appear before, I think it was joint rules on a Sunday afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. And it wasn't clear what the committee, uh, that committee was looking for, but what we attempted to do by way of memorandum to that committee was to outline uh, some of the issues that we had seen developing very early on in, in, the, um, in this process. Uh, and particularly since the court, as I'm sure all of you know, um, um, enacted Administrative Order 49, which essentially limited the types of hearings that the court could schedule, essentially uh, all emergency uh, hearings, and then listed those that fit in their opinion, fit that category. They also gave some leeway uh, that would allow uh, filings to come before the local judge and if they did not appear to fit into the categories that the Supreme Court had listed, they could refer them to me. And I, would, I wouldn't be deciding the merits of the issue, but I would decide whether the uh, allegations rose to an emergency level that I could then direct the local judge to hear. So that's how we've been operating for the last uh, few weeks. And um, we're also re uh, operating with substantially reduced staff in every court. Every court is still operating, but on a very limited basis. And the staffing, um, the, the staffing is really what's driving the ability to work. Um, even when these emergency requests come in, the first um, question to be asked, do we have staff available? Or when do we have staff available to schedule these proceedings? Because um, staff levels change in the courts from day to day. Uh, Terry Scott of uh, Chief of Trial Court Operation uh, has a, a daily check-in with um, all of the courts to determine what the staffing is, and um, that that um, you know that's really driving a lot of what we're able to schedule or when we're able to schedule it. Um, the types of things we're hearing, of course, are um, incarcerated uh, individuals either by way of arraignment, uh, all of which are being done via video now, as far as I know. Um, bail reviews uh, in the juvenile proceedings that we're hearing emergency uh, requests for a change of parent-child contact, the same applies in the domestic docket. Um, 
we're still hearing RFAs. And most of those are done remotely. If uh, someone does not have remotely by telephone, if someone does not have access to phones, uh, then they will still come into court to hear those. But essentially the, the, the bill was what we were seeing in the courts. And for instance, um, the issue, one of the early issues identified were what do we do about evictions? And there is a bill as I'm sure you all know um, in legislature now to put a stay on evictions and foreclosure proceedings. So the piece that you see in this bill uh, that came from the judiciary was essentially a recognition early on that at least the Supreme Court um, was not going to impose a stay of evictions. Uh, they did not see it as uh, their function, their role, um, and believe that the legislature and or the executive branch should impose a stay if there's going to be one. So this was a very early piece, at least from us saying, well, if there's no stay, this is something that would allow the court some discretion on these um, rent escrow orders. Uh, for those of you that don't know, when an eviction proceeding is filed, and I'm talking a residential uh, eviction, the earliest hearing is what's called a rent escrow hearing, meaning the landlord and uh, tenant come to the courthouse. Um, if the tenant is going to want to remain in the property, they have to pay the rent uh, going forward. We defer the decision on any back rent that's accumulated. Um, but the rent escrow orders allow them to remain in the property. Um, and so this first section of the bill was a recognition that under the current circumstances, um, economic and public health, individuals may not be able to um, uh, pay the, the rent as ordered. So it gave the court some flexibility uh, that it otherwise didn't have. And the, really the only change uh, there you'll see um, discretion, it changed one word. In other words, instead of saying shall pay, it said may, so the court could entertain that. That's essentially where that comes from. Um, the other, section two, execution uh, powers of attorney and section three relating to deeds really is a recognition of um, the fact that with the governor's order on uh, stay at home, stay safe, um, getting notary publics or the availability of notary publics, uh, the meeting of face-to-face -face in order to have a document signed before a notary public, both those sections, uh, the court supports, they, didn't, they weren't in our original memo. These came, some of this bill comes from other sources, but that's the reason those are there to address the issue of the, either the lack of notaries, people who are notaries not wanting to perform that role or doing it in a, a way that would allow for uh, social distancing. Um, section four is part of the uh, court's request, judiciary request. And that is driven by the fact that under the current rule 43, uh, the presence of the defendant is required during certain or most proceedings. And this was a recognition, um, certainly by the judiciary, that as this pandemic unfolded, um, we now have uh, avail um, video available in all of the Department of Corrections facilities and through the major courts, Wyndham, Windsor, Caledonia, Orleans, Washington, Bennington, Rutland, Chittenden, and Franklin counties. And uh, we're, we're already had the ability through rules to allow for rule five or the initial proceedings via video, which uh, would lead to arraignments. Um, but it quickly became apparent that uh, attorneys in the courts uh, saw uh, an avenue of conducting other proceedings that we hadn't done before. For instance, um, plea changes via video, uh, sentencing. And these were all uncontested matters. In other words, we weren't uh, going ahead with contested sentencing. But it, the best example I can give you is someone who was incarcerated, uh, who had a uh, pending charge that by agreement of the parties, 
that was presented to the court. This individual was not necessarily going to be released, but the fact that they were still on a detention or detainee pretrial status, they weren't allowed to participate in certain programs. And so by allowing a sentencing to go ahead via video, uh, the person could enter the plea, be sentenced, and not have to leave the facility. Um, I'm sure you've heard testimony from Department of Corrections or Will that one of their biggest risks is uh, having individuals come out of the facility and then go back in uh, right away. So this allowed us to do certain things, but it required the defendant to uh, waive uh, personal appearance um, and the, with the consent of the defense attorneys proceed this way, but it's not provided for that. That's not provided for in the current rule. So this rule is to specifically say that the defendant, after consulting with the attorney, their attorney, they can waive their personal appearance and personal appearance for purposes of the rule going forward would, could be accomplished either by telephone or video. Um, so this, in, in my opinion, is a, a very important part of, of this bill. And I believe it has the support and Marshall, I see is on and can speak to it, but uh, uh, the Defender General spoke in favor of, of this um, piece and I'll obviously let them speak for themselves, but um, I think everyone saw the value in uh, allowing this. Um, and I'll just keep going unless you want questions on specific sections, I can come back. Um, so section five is, is really a, a broad-based recognition that um, because of the reduced staffs, because of the limited um, time in court, the limited schedules, uh, that a lot of statutory guideline timeframes, timelines could not be met. And for the most part, people recognize that they couldn't be met. So this is just a relaxation of certain guidelines, for instance, bail review, um, or, or review of conditions of release. Um, it just expands them, I think it's up to 14 days, um, seven days and 14 days, as opposed to uh, 48 hours under uh, bail review. And I think it's 10 days, Marshall, on uh, conditions of release. So it just expanded them, but it was more a recognition of we're not able to get to them in a timely fashion. And that was true of, um, Other, other uh, timelines in committee may be aware at one point there was provisions in here to relax the timeframes on some mental health hearings. Uh, that was taken out of the bill. I don't know if it'll appear again, but again, it was really from the judiciary's perspective, uh, it was more of a practical recognition that we're not meeting those timelines. Um, and so they're out. Um, but the mental health hearing timelines are out of the bill. Um, when you get into section two, and again, this is uh, section five, but it's section two of that bill I'm reading on page five, line eight. That again is a recognition of in this time frame, and particularly even when we come away from the so called AO 49 emergency provisions, we're going to have a significant backlog in all of our dockets. And the court is in the process now of going through a process of trying to uh, come up with a priority of cases in each of the dockets and that's going to take some time. This is again a recognition that requests to seal and expunge uh, can be time consuming with staff. We have limited staffs and even when these emergency orders are lifted we don't necessarily anticipate that with the switch, uh, you know, changing the, changing the date is all of a sudden going to mean we're gonna have full staffs. So this again is a recognition. We're just not gonna be able to get to those um, requests for expungement or sealing. Um, and that's why it's reflected uh, in there for, I think it's 100, 120 days. Um, uh, Selena? What is the status, um, Judge Gerson, of the in the budget adjustment? Um, you know, there were additional positions, temporary positions, um, and I believe that's in the, your current budget request too. 
solely for the expungement work. So what is what is the status of those positions and um, those workflows or those among the people who are not currently working? Um, like what, can you just fill us in on, on how those resources are being used? I will try to, I mean, the, the legislature, I, I don't know if it was the last session or the session before approved um, funding for, I, th I wanna say it was five positions um, under the, under the um, expungement and sealing process and, and the, the offenses that were included in that going back a, at least a session, maybe two ago. So those folks have been hired and they are part of the, the process that I'm saying now we are operating with reduced staffs in every court, every courthouse. Um, but I think what you're referring to is we did have a, a request in this session because of increased, um, increasing the types of offenses uh, for expungement and or sealing. I think we had an additional request for staffing needs, but you know, that obviously hasn't happened. Um, Right. I think I meant to, I'm asking more about the status of the, the current workers that the workers that are currently funded. Well, the I guess I, I would say that the people that were hired in those positions are considered staff. So it's not as if we've isolated them to do only expungements, not in this emergency situation. I mean, if that was the case, um, I mean, the staffs go from uh, docket to docket, sometimes court to court. So it's not as if those positions were isolated. And while everything else is struggling to schedule, we would say, okay, you were hired to do expungements and sealings. You're going to do that. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, they're part of the court staff. They're part of the reduced court staff. Um, and these just can't be a priority, certainly under the current circumstances. I know that's difficult for folks that have worked long and hard on expungement and the sealing process, but um, we don't have a choice. We have to set some priorities within the um, within the court process. And if you've had reference or had the chance to look at um, AO 49, it's clearly not identified as an emergency process that has to, has to proceed. It's not on the list. D does that answer the question? I think it does. I just, uh, I think we fund, yeah. I mean, of, of course I understand that that is not on the um, emergency list of, of things that um, have to proceed right now in this very, very, pared down world. I think I'm thinking more about the like, what comes afterwards part of things and was just trying to understand how those um, positions were being utilized, you know, like, especially in this time period. But I think I was just a little confused by part of your answer where it sounded like you were saying like, well, those people were never just doing expungements, but I think we- Oh, they, no. I, then I misspoke. What I was trying to say was misunderstood. To the extent that they were doing that before this emergency happened, they would now be devoted to whatever process, whatever uh, matters are being scheduled in the courts now. I mean, they mean, you know, an individual may not be there at all. I mean, some staff members no longer come in. So the staff members that do come in and are coming in in some places on a rotating schedule um, are going to have to do whatever that day's work uh, calls for and expungement just isn't in that mix. So um, th that that's what I was trying to say when they're not isolated during the course of this emergency period to do only um, the work they were hired to do. Everybody's doing things that they may not have been hired to do. In other words, another example maybe that would help is um, 
the Wyndham Civil Court, for instance, uh, got down to one staff member. And we didn't close the court, but we've certainly suspended operations in that court to send that staff member over to assist in the family criminal division where they're even on a reduced level, that's where most of the cases that are being heard uh, require staffing. So uh, even though that person was hired as a docket clerk, if you will, in the civil division, they're now over in another courthouse uh, handling other matters. And, and I'm sure that's what's happening with the people that were hired as uh, to do the expungement and sealing work. And it's just gonna take a while to get back to whatever normal is on the other side of this. That's why we've asked for the extended time after the emergency is lifted. So um, I do see Barbara's hand, but Judge, I'm gonna ask you to, to go through the, um, finish nope. going through the memo and then we'll get back to um, okay. our section by section questions. Um, with Barbara up first. Just trying to see where I left off. Oh, uh, section three, again, I'm on still on page five, uh, beginning of line 13, again, is a recognition. What was happening was that uh, DUI cases, when they come in, um, also carry with them what are referred to as civil suspension proceedings relating to the suspension of the driver's license. And they have, again, specific timelines uh, that have to be uh, heard uh, 21 days from the time the person was stopped, 42 days from the time the case comes into court. And we were just unable to, to uh, with any certainty, uh, guarantee that those timelines could be met. So that again is a recognition uh, that we're not able to schedule those cases. Um, and therefore those timelines have been suspended and because they would otherwise call sometimes for an automatic license suspension, uh, the Senate Judiciary included the provision uh, that licenses would not be suspended until we could schedule those civil suspension proceedings. Um, section six uh, relates to the statute of limitations in civil actions. And that's merely a recognition that um, for any number of reasons that have arisen during the emergency period, uh, we have told the statute of limitations until this emergency is over, and I believe it's 60 days. Um, in other words, if, if a lawsuit had to be filed uh, today during the emergency period, um, and not knowing if attorneys uh, who are handling a particular case for a client were able uh, to process that matter, um, the court uh, recognize the need to have a, a, a delay in the filing of that action 60 days after the emergency period. So no one would lose uh, the possibility of a, a claim being filed due to the emergency or due to the unavailability of, of the lawyer um, or, or any uh, other number of issues. And finally, um, section seven was just added recently and in my opinion, in addition to the provision relating to video appearances, this is probably the most important part of this bill because the longer this has gone on, the more we realize the, the inability to uh, have notarized uh, documents uh, filed and certainly in some cases timely filed. So this is an amendment to an existing uh, 4VSA 27B um, again, I'm looking on page six, uh, section seven, beginning on line four, the reference to on line nine to title four, section 27B is a, a statute relating to electronic filing, um, which is not available in all of our courts. Um, but it was a recognition again, that if you're filing electronically, you would not have um, a notarized document. It allows for documents to be filed in lieu of a notary to use the statement uh, of a sworn declaration that begins on line 13. And so this statute, uh, if um, included in the bill, would be a broad based, would apply to any filings with court with the two notable exceptions on the bottom. Uh, that section would not apply to a search warrant 
or non-testimonial identification order, meaning they would still require notary publics, and that is the same language that is in uh, Title IV, uh, 27B under existing law. Um, so in sum and substance, that, that's, that's the bill. Uh, those are areas that we felt um, needed to be addressed. Thank you. So um, I'm actually gonna go past the judge's time because I think the committee does have um, some, some questions. And um, so, so Barbara, if you um, ask your concerns about section five or, or if you had something else at the time, but, but uh, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Judge Guru, Sam. Hello there. So can you, I just wanna back up for one second before I get into more specifics about um, section five. Was mm -hmm. there any kind of decision matrix that was used? I know um, the Chief Justice talked a little bit about courts and pandemic planning to sort of look at what, like what the most important actions that the court needs to take. You know, if it's like uh, physical harm, harm to, um, civil liberty. So I guess I'm just wondering when you've had to make these tough choices about what things um, will go on sort of the back burner and what things won't, if there's any kind of framework that that was used or, or was it more of a just discussion? Well, well, certainly there was discussion, but I, I'm not sure what you mean by a framework. I mean, there certainly wasn't a grid that was created that you know, went through the, the myriads of cases that come into probate, criminal, family, and civil. Uh, but it right. was certainly a recognition, I think, in every docket that um, certain types of cases had to go forward. Um, and as, as the court has gone on, obviously, this whole process um, is evolving for everyone. And sure. they made, I think, I want to say they're up to at least five or maybe even six amendments since then. So there has been recognition as we go along that they need to go back and, and look at, um, at proceedings. So, okay. I, you know, it was certainly a deliberative. Um, oh, I bet. I bet. I, yeah. I, and it's not like as easy as like an ER decision-making matrix, but could, would you by chance know um, where we stand now in terms of how caught up we are in expungements and sealings that have been um, requested, but might have, ha you know, pre-emergency um, order, like, or do we have a backlog already? Are we pretty caught up? With expungements and sealings, mm -hmm. I, I I really don't have any idea. I can tell you that over the last few weeks, if any have come in, I I can't tell you that they haven't been addressed. But it, it's it's um, it's not a priority. I mean the the it was the the court staffs um, in no small part that were seeing the need to have this. Um, postponement, if you will, of processing those. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't tell you if every request that came in before the emergency started had been addressed or what the backlog is. And I don't know if there's any process that could be put in place or modified where these could be done um, by folks off site. I realized that um, the staff that Representative Coburn was referring to are, I don't even think they're full time. So I don't know how much they get paid when they don't work. And so I'm thinking it's sort of a win-win if they can do the work and people who want to get expunged um, are able to get their records expunged. I, so I don't know what the volume normally would be, but I'm thinking as we're getting more people out of um, prison now, we've heard that we're down like 200 people roughly, I think. And I know a lot of people have lost their jobs temporarily or permanently. So I'm also concerned about people who are going to apply for jobs as the pandemic, um, as we come out on the other side and 
the obstacle of being able to get a job if expungement um, isn't occurring? Well, expungement and sealing will occur, but it'll have to occur in, in, a, in a time frame that recognizes uh, that other matters may take precedence over, over those particular issues. I can tell you without knowing every single person that came out of jail, if they've come out of an incarcerative sentence, it'll be a little while before they're eligible for sure. expungement or sealing. So right. it, it's not that we're ignoring it, but there has to be a recognition uh, in, in every uh, facet of the, of, the, of the judicial system, whether it's family or civil or criminal, uh, that we have, we're going to have to establish priorities of cases uh, that are coming out um, at the, whenever this emergency is over. Um, there's going to be a significant backlog, and the priority has to be on um, people who are incarcerated awaiting trial. We've had trials that um, have been scheduled that jury drawings had to be canceled. These are people that are being held uh, without. Um, without bail. We have juvenile proceedings that have been put on the, had to be deferred merit hearings, disposition hearings. Um, so it's just, um, it's, it's a matter of, and, and I will say that the biggest concern, or one of the concerns I have is what will we have for staff when we come out of this? How long is it going to take to get back to what we used to think as normal, and there's probably going to be a new normal on the other side of this. So um, I understand the concern, but um, it's only one of many that we have. No, I, I know, and I guess I just wanna make sure that we're not in our decision-making sort of, we'll end up hearing from people who, um, I don't wanna say just have lobbyists, but who are able to articulate the work that they're doing and how it's held up. And I just wanna not forget about the people who can't be here to talk about the impact on them. Um, so it, your, your, your point a minute ago led me to my second worry, which is um, the changing the 48 hours and the seven days on the conditions and bail review, um, increasing the time. So isn't that, theoretically adding to the time that somebody would be incarcerated without getting a chance to have their um, bail reviewed or their conditions reviewed? Well, I couldn't say that it doesn't extend the time because it extends it, for instance, from 48 hours to seven days. Right. But as I said earlier, that's more of a recognition of what we're able to do with the resources we have. And um, I, I think on the, on the, if I can say the positive side of this, I think you're seeing for the first time in most people's memory, the, the incarcerated population going down in the detainee number uh, going down below 300. I don't know what it is today, but um, below 300. So I think you're finding that, and, and certainly my recommendations to the trial judges in considering uh, bail requests, um, I would like to think that everyone is taking a closer look at um, what kinds of cases where bail is being set. So I think the majority of cases that I'm seeing, and, and I'm sure Marshall uh, has as much information as I do, but what I'm seeing is the more serious cases um, that are coming in on bail reviews. And it's not as if we're going to use that time frame to say, okay, we've got 14 days to do this. We're trying to get them in as quickly as possible. Um, and, and we will still attempt to do that. But this, again, is more of a recognition of the inability to meet those time frames than anything else. And going from 48 to 14 days, you don't think there's any um chance to kind of tighten that up so it's not really going to two full weeks? It's not It's not uh, all 14 days. So the first section on page five uh, right. on line four, section A talks about, um, 
conditions of release relating to the setting of bail, cash bail, uh, goes from 48 hours to seven days. Conditions of release that are just conditions and not bail are the 14 days. So that's changing something from a curfew, could be anything from changing a curfew to changing a, a, a residence, um, changing a reporting requirement. So it's the first one that goes from 48 hours, seven days. That's a, a week. What I can't tell you is when someone files that bail review um, on a Wednesday of a given week, I cannot guarantee anyone at this point that we are able to have that hearing on Friday of that same week. So this gives us some flexibility in scheduling that. Um, we just don't have the ability to move as quickly on these matters um, as we're used to. Do, I, do we like this? No. We, we understand the need to get these matters heard. It doesn't mean because it's seven days that we're going to schedule it seven days out. It may mean that they will, if we have the judge available and the time and the staffing, um, that we will bring it in either the next day or within the, the original 48 hours. Thank you, Judge. And then, uh, Martin, do you want to weigh in on your concerns regarding uh, section, what is it, five? Uh, yeah, it's, three? it's uh, section five, but it's uh, the subsection three regarding three. the uh, suspensions of uh, driver's license uh, for uh, DUI. Um, and I, I was just that that was just one area in this bill that gave me biggest pause and biggest concern if if somebody who would otherwise have their driver's license suspended for six months or three years or whatever uh, all of a sudden has doesn't have it suspended uh, until the delayed court hearing and and I noticed that in your uh, judge in your recommendations in your memo you didn't uh, you did suggest suspending uh, the hearings, but didn't suggest allowing the individual to retain their driving privileges uh, pending the hearing. Um, I, I didn't for the simple reason that, and it's no excuse, but the memo was prepared on relatively short notice to be able to present to that uh, the rules committee. And it's kind of taken on a life of its own so that um, as it went from my memo to a bill form in, in Senate Judiciary, my original thinking, I was only thinking of the DWIs that come in that don't have an automatic license suspension. Um, and I think it was the Defender General that in, in discussing this section of the bill with him pointed out that for subsequent offenses, there is an automatic license suspension. And when the bill came into the Senate Judiciary, that's when the discussion took place about license suspension. So um, that's why it's in there now. It's not that I... Sure, no, I, I guess I understand. Maybe, maybe this is gonna be a better, better question for Marshall as far as uh, why do we have to allow the individual to continue uh, with the driver's license? I'll ask you first, but that's gonna be one for Marshall as well. And is there, is there perhaps another route that one could go, for instance, uh, and there's a question at the end of this, <clears throat> for, for these various uh, offenses, civil offenses, one of the uh, options is to have a ignition interlock device. Uh, I, I could, for this interim period, have a waiver of the application fee and the individual has to get an in, inner, uh, an ignition interlock device if he or she wants to continue to drive. Otherwise, the license is suspended until that hearing occurs. Um, or are, are we not seeing the ability to do ignition interlock devices right now because of the uh, coronavirus? I, maybe there's another option. I, I'm just very concerned about for some amount of period of time during the the situation we're in now that individuals who have uh, driven with a 0.16 uh, blood alcohol level and may have had a previous uh, DUI can continue to have a license and those privileges. 
in the interim. Let me go back to the beginning of your question. It, from our, from the judiciary's perspective, the reason I originally proposed the waiver of those initial timelines, uh, I, I will be quite honest with you. I, I didn't consider the license suspension consequences because I wasn't thinking of subsequent offenses. It was driven by the fact that we would have difficulty in scheduling these civil suspension hearings uh, in a timely fashion during this period. And so that was what drove my original request. And I had not considered the consequences of subsequent offenses. That's why I'm saying that came in later as more people became involved in a discussion of the, the, uh, the area that I was pointing to and I hadn't considered it. So are there other alternatives? Uh, there may be, but to the extent that they require processing in court, um, through through civil suspension proceedings, uh, or even the prosecution of the DUI offenses, um, the the problem is in finding the time and the the ability to process those cases. DUIs in and of themselves are not considered a priority uh, and not considered an emergency uh, hearing, uh, other than that. We were bringing in DUIs for um, arraignment purposes. In other words, asking people who otherwise would be released on conditions of release to come into court where our goal has been to minimize people coming into court. They were coming into court solely to set these timelines for a civil suspension hearing. And so that's what drove the original request on my part was to really avoid having people to come in and uh, come into court um, because the, they, that's the only way the process worked. That process can't be done remotely? The what? That process can't be done remotely? Well, if they're cited in, they, they need to have an attorney uh, assigned and uh, we have to set those deadlines. There's not... I guess to some extent you could do it remotely, but we do not have the time uh, to schedule these matters for hearing. Um, Is it possible to just carve out subsequent offenses, uh, not have the situation where the where there's a, um, a delay of the hearing or a suspension of the hearing, or is that still a large number? Uh, I, I do not have the numbers for you today, and I, I don't know if Marshall does. Um, he might have a better handle on the numbers of cases his office sees. Um, but part of the problem also is when you come to the civil suspension piece is that they, since they are civil proceedings, uh, attorneys are not always assigned to those, they're not assigned to those cases. Some defenders choose to represent individuals in those civil suspension proceedings because they are so aligned with the DUI processing. But that does not happen in every county. Um, in some counties, I would see the public defender there for a, a DUI uh, uh, case, but they would not be representing the individual in a civil suspension because it is not a criminal offense. Um, and so that varies from county to county um, as to how that happens. So it's not as simple as saying, can you have a remote uh, proceeding? Um, because it may be a remote proceeding with a pro se, a self-represented litigant, and that creates other, other issues. So what I thought was a, a rather straightforward request uh, is obviously much more uh, complex than I appreciated when I put that in that memo. And you were speaking to some of those issues and, and uh, the Defender General did as well when it went in front of Senate Judiciary. Um, and that's why the bill appears as it does. Um, it, there is an evolution here of that particular piece. Right. Thank you. Right, well, I guess I uh, kind of hear from the defenders on that particular issue as well. Um, but it, I'm still troubled that the subsequent offenses, it could be some number of months when there doesn't seem to be uh, any consequences for, for that particular individual. We do need to, yeah. the, the only other thing I would say is that, you know, th 
these cases don't necessarily resolve themselves in the, the same time frame we're talking about this emergency anyway. It, it's the, the, because a DWI comes in during the emergency period, let's assume this emergency period ends, let's just say for the sake of argument, the 1st of June. It's unlikely anything would have happened between March 17th when the administrative order went into effect and in June 1st, just because of the nature of the docket in the scheduling matters. So I don't think it's a question of obviously how long this process goes on and how long it takes us to get back to normal. But am I not, am I mistaken? I thought that uh, the uh, driver's license is automatically suspended. So during that period of time, the driver's license would be suspended, presumably. It is for subsequent offenses, not, not the- That's what, not yeah, the, that's what, that's the realm I've been concerned about. And that's what I've been talking about. All right. All right, thanks. Okay. The, okay. You, I, if you're, I don't know if you're done with me or not, but I had heard through other uh, folks that you've had other witnesses testifying um, not necessarily on this bill yet, but on other issues that may uh, pertain to the judiciary, including RFAs. And I don't know if you want me to get into that now, or if that's coming at a later time today or some other day, but. Um, yeah, no, let's, let's wait on that. The question was, um, are there other things that, for instance, since your memo, um, you know, that are be coming to light that might need work on it. So um, we're behind on this. So let's let's stick to this. Okay. Uh, but I'm but, available if yeah. you need me on other matters. Yeah, that would be that'd be helpful. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. So we're gonna take Marshall now. Um, okay. Um, can you hear me? Are people able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I've seen some nods. Okay. Um, so I will pick up where the judge and Representative Lalonde left off in talking about DUIs and sort of work my way backwards just for the sake of convenience. Um, and I think that the DUI question, I, I totally understand um, the concern, but I think that in this case, there's really no other option. The only option is to either schedule the hearings and have the hearings take place, which I think would be very difficult given the current level of staffing, not just in the judiciary, um, but in defense offices, prosecutors offices, uh, frankly at DMV uh, is also involved in those hearings. Um, and I think that the real issue is that there's no way that you, what you cannot do is you can't say, we're going to impose the suspension but with no time frame for the hearing. And that's because it's a due process issue that if the government's gonna take something away, even if it is something, uh, just a driver's license, uh, and even if it's just temporary, there has to be some sort of a hearing on that. And the constitution definitely favors what they call a pre-deprivation hearing, meaning that you get a hearing about whether or not it's okay to take that driver's license away before the driver's license is actually taken away. But the constitution also recognizes that there's some circumstances where the government has such a strong interest that they can take something away from somebody, deprive something from somebody and have the hearing afterwards. But if they're gonna do that, there's very strict guidance out there about how fast that, what they call a post deprivation hearing has to take place. And in this case, it's been recognized that this 42 days is an, is a acceptable time frame. That if, you're, if, that if you take somebody's driver's license away for a, sub, a second or subsequent DUI, that that's okay as long as you have a hearing on that deprivation within 42 days. Now, the problem is that if you were to just simply say, we're going to keep the suspensions in place, but we're not going to schedule the hearings, you would essentially be saying that you're getting, uh, the government's taking your license away, and there is no time frame for a post-deprivation hearing. And that's where you would run into constitutional issues. It would be a, a Matthews v. Eldridge problem. Um, and so 
what I would say is that the, there's really two ways this can be handled. One is the way that it is handled in the bill currently, which is to simply say, we're going to treat second and subsequent DUIs the same way we treat first time DUIs, which is you don't have your license taken away until you've had your civil suspension hearing. Um, or we could say, we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that we have that hearing within the 42 days. Whether or not that's something that all the players in the system could accommodate, I don't know. But just legally speaking, I think those are the only two options. Um, I'm happy to take questions about that or move on to other things. So, <clears throat> Marshall, I, I haven't done the deep legal analysis on this, but but I, <clears throat> I don't think that this is the only legal way that this could be done. Uh, just for example, I mean, the 42 days is not something that, uh, it, I mean, yes, that's, a, that's enough for a post deprivation time frame, but in, in other situations, longer periods than that are, have also been considered fine uh, for the promptness of a post deprivation hearing. Uh, so I could understand that there could be an extension of those time frames. I, I agree, having no date at all is problematic, but if you said, it's going to be 120 days. Uh, yeah, maybe that's going to be litigated, but I, I know that there's other situations where that has been found to be a, a sufficiently prompt. Uh, or another alternative also could be that, yeah, it's going to be, pick a number, 90 days. Uh, and if the hearing is not held within the 90 days, the license uh, will be uh, reinstated. I mean, so that, that's, there, there are a couple other ways to get at this where somebody with a second or subsequent uh, loses their driver's license and still has the uh, sufficiently prompt post deprivation hearing. And if it's not done in that prompt manner, then, then again, it's reinstated. So it, it would seem to me that that's like something like that could work. And I don't have an answer because the nature of Matthews is that there's no way to predict what uh, a Matthews analysis results in because it is one of, you know, in my opinion, one of the least useful Supreme Court cases out there in terms of providing you with any guidance or any ability to sort of look at a situation and try to figure out how a court would resolve it. Um, so I don't have an answer for you in terms of would 180 days be okay, would, uh, would 90 days be okay. You know, that's something that would simply have to be put to litigation. Um, and frankly, I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that it's current. I don't think that this is the right time for that kind of uncertainty. Um, so, you know, our position on it would be to either maintain the status quo and just make the hearings take place, um, which would not be ideal because these are often contested hearings. They are often joined with uh, other hearings in a DUI. So for example, often a civil suspension hearing will be joined with a suppression hearing for the criminal case. Um, and you wind into wind up in weird situations where you have uh, the criminal cases being completely halted by executive order or administrative order 49, but then you know the civil proceedings still going on or something would get complex. Um, so it wouldn't be our preference, but I do think that if you you know if you have the hearings, if you make the hearings take place even during the uh, pandemic and even during administrative order 49 that could work um, or just simply leave it as we're gonna treat DUI twos the same way we treat DUI ones, which is to say no deprivation until you've had your hearing. I mean, I, I don't think that that's an option as far as having the hearings, but maybe I'll turn back around to get the judge's input on, on the concept of a, I'll pick a number 120 days and, and you lose your license and they may, are unable to get the hearing uh, in that 120 day period the license uh, would be reinstated. Uh, I don't know if, if I should ask the judge that right now or, or wait until Marshall's done with the rest, uh, Maxine. Well, I mean, I'll just jump in with my concern about that 120 day. And then if there's no hearing, then it's just a suspension. I mean, I guess my concern with that is just, you know, in addition to the constitutional concerns and the litigation that would necessarily ensue, is just sort of the fundamental unfairness. We, we actually see, um, fairly regularly, uh, defendants being successful at civil suspension hearings and having their licenses 
uh, you know, winning the civil suspension hearing. It's not at all uncommon. Um, so really what we would be saying then is just on the basis of an arrest alone with no, with never, you know, never getting to the point of going into court and proving your case, you're gonna be denied your ability to drive at a really crucial time. Um, honestly, when there's a lot of services that have shut down, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's really difficult to get access to public transportation right now. And you'd be saying, we're gonna take everybody and say, for four months, you're not gonna have a hearing. And then you may never have a hearing at all. It may be that the hearing never takes place and you just had a four month license suspension without any ever having an ability to challenge. And just as a matter of fundamental fairness, I think that's something that um, would be problematic. Okay. Yeah, um, Selena, go ahead. I think you're still muted, Representative Coburn. I couldn't hear anything. Sorry, I'm always like simultaneously trying to lower my hand and unmute my mic and forgetting to do one. Yeah, and it's not really a question. It's just like more, uh, unless you want to add more detail, but just, I think like, I hear your concerns representative alone, and, but I also think we have this balancing test of like the public safety implications of not doing the suspensions and then the public safety implications of taking potentially vulnerable people and <coughs> like further isolating them for, um, long periods of time right now with the world the way it is right now. And I don't know how we solve that balancing test, but that, that seems to be a critical part of the question we'd have to weigh here, you know? Isn't that what we're trying to do is isolate people <laughs> as much as well, possible? Yeah, but uh, they so can't get I understand that's a little bit different though. Yeah. I understand it's different. So let's get, let's, um, let's get through testimony because we're we're behind time which I, and I think it's important to have taken the time but I also want to make sure that Marshall gets to uh, the um, expungement and uh, and the conditions of release in those other sections so addressing the expungement and conditions of release um, on the expungements we've always supported some sort of automation of the expungement system I don't think that's actually a remedy here though um, and the reason for that is that they're not going to be able to do any, the judiciary wouldn't be able to implement any sort of automatic expungement system that didn't require staff time and staff work um, anytime, hopefully, within the duration of this pandemic. I'm hoping it doesn't last until we have, you know, finally a fully functional uh, electronic system that can do those kinds of things. Um, and really, honestly, from our perspective, expungements just are not a priority right now. Our focus has been on getting people out of facilities. And um, when we, you know, in the last few weeks since I've been on the phone constantly dealing with clients, dealing with attorneys, I haven't had anybody ask me about expungement. It's been the first like two week period in months, maybe even years where nobody's asked me about expungement. So we just don't see it as a priority. And we don't have a problem with the, um, sort of suspension of expungements right now with the 120 day extension so that there's not a huge backlog that hits the judiciary as soon as AO49 is lifted. Um, as far as the, uh, the extensions of time for bail review and conditions of release review, um, we don't oppose what's in the bill, which is not to say that we are super supportive of it. Um, you know, we don't love the idea of extending the timeframes for those reviews, but honestly, uh, this bill is more of a reflection of what's actually happening than it is a reflection of sort of what we all desire. And frankly, we're not seeing too much of a problem. Um, people who want to be heard quickly are being heard quickly. And there's actually really good work going on on the judiciary's part that we support uh, that really requires this, uh, you know, these timeline extensions. So for example, bail reviews that are all raising the same issues uh, regarding the existence of uh, coronavirus in facilities and the transmission of coronavirus around facilities are all being transferred and heard in front of the same judge all at one time, which we think is a positive thing. We think that's gonna lead to more consistent uh, and more accurate results on these 
on these bail reviews that are all raising the same issues. And that's something, you know, that sort of consolidation of cases is something that would be impossible if the normal 48 day, a 48 hour, I'm sorry, timeline was in place. So we're not opposed, but at the same time, I'll say that we, you know, are concerned that there will be cases where people will not get access to a bail review when they need one. Um, and so that's a provision that we're mixed on, but we don't oppose it because really, frankly, we're not sure how else it would work out, uh, just given the resources that are available to the judiciary. And we do see some benefit in this time in, uh, where things are moving so quickly um, in giving the judiciary the latitude they need to be able to consolidate these cases and hear these cases in a way that ensures some consistency uh, so that it's not that people are getting, you know, raising the very same issues and getting very disparate results from county to county and that sort of thing. So um, while, you know, the, the idea of extending the time frames for bail reviews certainly makes me as a defense attorney a little queasy, I think that in this situation for these purposes, um, it's not at all inappropriate. Um, and I think that actually addresses all of the questions that were in the email. I'm happy to also speak to any questions that were not in the email. Thank you. Committee? Okay, great. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, David, uh, if you are still available, and we'll take, we'll, we'll hear from uh, John at the end if we have time. And if not, we do have extra time tomorrow uh, if folks are available. Okay. Sure, for having me. Um, I, I actually don't think I have a huge amount to add to what's been discussed. I, I And I'll go through just a couple of the um, points here that affect our office in particular. Um, one is with respect to the um, extension of the civil um, timelines, the uh, civil case timelines. And with that one, you know, theoretically, our office could be impacted in the state of Vermont, uh, theoretically could be impacted with respect to extending the, the time to file on those. But we do think it is a fair and reasonable thing to do, even if it means that there some cases might end up getting filed that wouldn't have otherwise, because the people who would not be able to uh, sort of navigate this unusual world are most likely the pro se individuals um, who may have a valid claim uh, to make. And uh, we wouldn't want to see them be treated differently or in effect be treated differently than uh, more sophisticated parties who retain law firms. So we think it's a, a fair thing to do, despite the fact that it, it may be exposing um, uh, our, the state to a, a few more cases, although we really don't imagine it would be a dramatic difference. Uh, with respect to the DUI timeline issue that's come up uh, a few times on this call, as I've testified before, our office really doesn't do too many DUIs, and so I'll, I'll, I think I would largely stay out of that thicket. Um, I do think that there are interests on both sides here that are important, both the public safety interest uh, in terms of keeping the roads safe from potentially unsafe drivers, but also a very real due process interest that's reflected in the current timelines. Um, and, uh, you know, there may be that there's a solution that can be arrived at with respect to uh, a sort of longer time period after which if there's no hearing, a license comes back on a temporary basis. I think that's something that is a, a reasonable discussion, but uh, this legislation, the proposed legislation, is really recognizing the realities that the courts are operating under. Um, and there's a lot of issues out there that are being delayed that have a really grave impact on people's lives. And I think it's important to, as the judge alluded to, um, there's a lot of really pressing matters that the courts are trying to balance in a very difficult time. So I, I think just keeping that context in mind is important. And I, as, I, as I know, the committee knows. Um, the with respect to um, the various reviews and so forth, again, I think I, I don't have that much to add to what Judge Grierson and uh, and 
Attorney Paul had to say, uh, it is a reflection of what's happening now, as opposed to really like a, uh, a new policy that's being decided. The courts are doing the best they can and the lawyers are doing the best they can in very difficult circumstances to get to important hearings as quickly as they can. Um, and this legislation is a reasonable reflection of, of the best efforts that are being made. Thank you, David. Any questions for David? Okay, nope, I'm not seeing any. Okay, great. Thank you. So John, are you, are you available? I don't see Pepper, so I understand he's with another committee still perhaps. Nope, I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, yes, yeah, so I was trying to find my uh, unmute button. Uh, Pepper, I believe he's still over there with corrections. Um, I can uh, offer a couple of things if, you, if you'd like, um, and some of them, um, if you don't have time, we can uh, <clears throat> certainly uh, be available tomorrow, but um, I actually, on the DUI question that you just had, uh, one of the things I think you, should, you know, that can be pointed out is that the statute actually you know, says that the hearing should be had in a certain amount of time unless uh, good cause um, or some other issue comes up. And uh, I don't have the statute in front of me, but uh, I would uh, think that the pandemic and the situation we're in right now would certainly um, uh, qualify as that. But uh, uh, I think the biggest concern, and, and Representative Lalon pointed this out, are the subsequent uh, DUIs. Uh, you you have your um, uh, the second and third anything after the second it's and it's actually not the, the court that does the suspension it's it's really the DMV that does the automatic suspension so you may um, I'm not I don't believe that the Senate had anyone in from DMV but you may want to ask them um, you know what the process is uh, and how they would uh, and what this would mean uh, for them going forward. Am I still here? Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. It was like it was dead. I'm going. This is like dead air back in the radio days. Yeah, no, keep no, keep going. Okay, okay. So that's that's just with the with the DUI. Um, and right now I'm also just trying to go down to get those questions that were uh, being posed because I have about 30 documents open in front of me on my computer. So if you just give me a second here. Um, I'll get those. Um, boom, boom, boom. Okay. Uh, so we're dealing obviously with just uh, section section um, five. Uh, you know, the judge uh, handled and, and explained extremely well about the the forty eight hours uh, and the need for that. That's that's all um, as far as right now. Resources are very difficult. Uh, I mean, they're 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 being taxed and. Uh, it, it would be difficult to have those, um, and so I think that he's addressed that, those issues uh, regarding the timing. And um, the expungement issue, again, I, I think I agree 100%. It's, uh, they're not, as Marshall pointed out, I, I don't believe that there is a you know, huge push for expungements at this point in time. And um, I, my concern is always that when, uh, and I, I think somebody suggested it might just make an, or we should make expungements automatic. I, I think it would be um, not in a, uh, it would not be a good idea to, uh, to make a change like this in haste, uh, especially during this time period. And one in which it's really not as, um, as critical as some of the other matters we're facing, um, you know, to me and to the state's attorneys, what what our concern is, we've been working very closely with uh, DOC uh, and with the defense bar and trying to get the detainees that we feel could be um, um, uh, would be able to be uh, sent back into the community uh, to so that they're not held uh, you know, during the time that they're in, you know, being detained. And we've been very successful, and as as you've seen, we've also there's been a, a extremely large um, uh, dip in the population of incarcerated, and that's uh, I, a lot, and uh, having to do with um, I think our work with the DOC and with uh, the Defense Bar. So we're continuing to do that, and um, the uh, the state's attorneys are 
we have our guidelines. Actually, we've had guidelines up for internally for um, three, three to four, we three weeks now, uh, and those are directive to, uh, especially in dealing with law enforcement and uh, explaining that we do not want uh, you to uh, making, be making arrests where you're going to be detaining people uh, unless it is something that's absolutely critical. Um, otherwise, they should be cited out, which is what has been happening. And so we are trying to do what we can uh, to um, contribute to uh, the lessening of the population that is currently uh, and they are the people that are being held by DOC. Um, and we see uh, the driver's license. I think I just explained that. And I I will just take questions because I don't see anything else here on these questions that has not already been uh, addressed completely by uh, the previous witnesses. Thank you, John. Committee questions? I am not seeing hands yet. Nope. Okay. Great. Great. So, all right. So, committee, actually, we still have more time. Any questions for, uh, for Judge Grierson in terms of this bill? Yes, Martin. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to that question I, or th what I raised with uh, Marshall as far as whether there, if I could have the judge's input on a concept of uh, having a time frame extended for second or subsequent of 90 days that there's the automatic suspension of licenses, but if there's not a hearing held within 90 days, uh, it would be reinstated automatically. Uh, if that's if you, you could just comment on that kind of concept, uh, Judge Gerson, that would be helpful. And you're on mute still. Sorry, um, it gave me time to think. Um, I think it's I think it's complicating an issue that it's complicated enough. And, and my concern is that not everyone involved in these, and I mentioned it earlier, not everyone involved in these processes has the benefit of uh, advice from, from attorneys. And um, I, think, I think we can still get to these matters in a timely fashion. Obviously, as we go through the dockets, when we come out on the other side of this, I would expect that these kinds of proceedings would have, at least the, the civil suspension would have uh, some level of priority in, in the criminal docket, not necessarily the underlying DUI because they invariably end up um, with, with um, can end up with, in jury trials. So they, they have a whole separate course, but these are preliminary hearings that I expect would be Heard within a reasonable time once that's over. I, I'm, I'm concerned about automatic um, suspensions. Um, and if I knew better when this was going to end and how long it would be back to normal, I think I could answer the question more definitively. But I, Fair enough. I'm, just, I'm just concerned. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on S114? Judge Grierson. Oh, yep. Go ahead. Uh, it's not. It's not a question actually for Judge Gerson. It was just more a uh, committee discussion on the just uh, some more folks. I think it would be helpful to hear from on the DUI piece if right. we're going right. to. But I'll no. Yeah, I'll get to that towards the end because I'm I'm making a list list too. We certainly okay. So since we do have a little bit more time. Um, uh, Judge Grierson, you had started to say that there um, may be some other areas that need uh, attention, or at the very least, bringing to our attention and possible possible legislation. Yeah, they were actually they they're not part of this bill because they were brought to my attention um, by other folks, and primarily this involves the issue of uh, RFA proceedings um, and issues related to that subject. Um, I've uh, communicated with Sarah Robinson and also to some extent uh, legal aid. And I guess I would start by saying that we are still 
RFAs are a uh, procedure that is still ongoing. We have not asked to change the timeframes related to those uh, proceedings. Otherwise, they would have been in this bill. Uh, we recognize the necessity of getting these types of cases in uh, as early as we can. And so the courts have uh, maintained their regular schedules for these. For the most part, my understanding is that they are being heard remotely, um, and that is by telephone. Um, I, I cannot tell you whether some attempts have not been made to, to um, do these by video. I can tell you that the court, in addition to the video systems that are in place, we are continuing to explore ways of uh, having hearings remotely, in other words, allowing people to appear uh, via Skype or Zoom or any other, excellent. but that's still a work in progress. So to a great extent, these hearings that are going forward, either the individuals are in court or maybe one individual is in court, one party, and the others are calling in. Um, I've had discussion with um, not only Sarah Robinson, but uh, Heather Holter um, from the Domestic Violence Council about the question of making telephone uh, appearances mandatory. And uh, my own uh, opinion, and I believe it's reinforced by the domestic violence people, is that that could be a mistake because not everyone has access uh, to phones. Um, and we don't want to preclude the possibility of um, someone not having access to a phone. So if, if people want to appear, uh, the courts are still having them appear in court and they want to appear by phone we're doing it that way so the the two issues that came up were if the committee will recall in six uh, h i think it's h610 uh, language about once a temporary order is issued and served the language in the bill i believe calls for the temporary order to continue uh, in force until it is dismissed or until a final order is served on the defendant. Um, that's language that we supported in 610, and we would certainly support it being included, whether it's in this bill or if you're working on some other bill where it would apply. Um, because we think it's, it's important, perhaps even more important now than it was originally, uh, for this reason, that if we get service on the defendant of a temporary order, whether or not they appear in court for that final hearing um, is more difficult during these times for the reasons I've stated. Um, somebody may attempt to, to call into court and um, maybe their phone runs out of battery so they're not able to, any number of things could happen why someone doesn't appear, but at least these orders would continue in full force and effect. Um, and, unless they're dismissed or uh, until the final order is served. So we think that Im that provision is important. Your Honor, excuse me, is, um, is there any concern about um, service or, or um, I've, heard, I've heard mixed things that law enforcement uh, might be concerned about actually serving orders I, for their, yeah. I, I have heard those comments. I've spoken uh, with, uh, I think John Campbell and I were on the phone probably a week or it seems, longer ago than that, to talk about that issue, Roger Marcou. And I think that there are concerns, they have been expressed, but my understanding is, and at least what I'm gathering from domestic violence, they are still serving these orders. Uh, now, maybe there will come a point in time when they say, no, we can't. Um, there's certainly less civil process being served these days. And if the stay on foreclosures and eviction goes through, there would be even less civil process. So it would still leave, you know, a, a limited number of orders. And because we've reduced the types of orders that are the issues that hearings that can be scheduled, I would like to think that there always be uh, enough um, sheriffs and, and process servers out there to serve these orders. But it is, it, I think it's an ongoing concern. Um, that has and I, been discussed. Right, and I um, I heard of it as a concern for the officer's right. safe, safety in terms yes. of contact and, um, yeah. Right, 
yeah, it's not just a matter of numbers being able to do it, but it's the, again, it comes right down to the very basic issues we're all discussing, and that is social distancing and stay home and um, going into areas where they don't have any knowledge or understanding of when they knock on the door, what the circumstances are. So there's certainly that, but as far as I know, uh, this, uh, these orders are still being served. So the issue, one of the issues that came up, um, and, I, and I could be wrong, but I, I had understood that you may have heard testimony last week from someone, I believe from legal aid who was suggesting that one, because of issues they had been seeing, and I don't know what the issues were because I didn't hear the testimony, but they were proposing that temporary orders once granted would extend throughout the life of this emergency period. Now, I don't know if that is an accurate uh, reflection of the testimony you heard. We're gonna be hearing from legal aid tomorrow. I think um, there was reference, but, um, but the person who testified didn't have the exact um, information. So we are gonna ask about that tomorrow. Okay. We do hear so, from that again, yeah. And my concern would be, as the committee may remember from other hearings, other testimony, these temporary orders are granted ex parte. In other words, without the opportunity for the defendant to respond. And the only way they can respond is to schedule the final hearing. So uh, extending an order, temporary order, an ex parte order without opportunity to be heard is not, uh, not anything that the judiciary would certainly support. Um, and the second piece, um, and I'll let obviously, um, Sarah will be testifying and other folks. These cases are still coming in. Um, and I think my sense is from, from talking with the judges that they are able to handle these proceedings. In other words, um, I don't wanna say in every case, but I think every attempt is made when parties come in, whether one's on the phone or one in court or they're both there, there is an attempt made to get an agreement uh, to see if the parties can agree on an order. Um, and I think that will continue. Um, and my, my sense from talking with the judges about some of these uh, changes is that they, at this point, feel that they're able to process these cases in a timely fashion um, and haven't encountered uh, difficulties other than the difficulty sometimes of having one party on the phone and one party in court. That presents all kinds of issues with, as far as presenting documents, uh, exhibits is made more difficult. Cross-examination of witnesses if one party is on the phone and one isn't, is extremely difficult. So I don't want you, the committee to think that it's not, um, it doesn't have its problems, but the judges, uh, all, all, I would almost say uniformly are saying, we're able to process these, um, we are certainly encouraging folks if they don't want to come to court, don't want to take a risk to call in. And we're not asking for formal written motions to be filed. If someone calls the court that morning and says, I, I'm, I'm afraid to come in, or for whatever reason, uh, can I appear by phone, we're granting those requests uh, as liberally as we can. So I would just be concerned about trying to change that process um, that seems to be working from, from our perspective. Um, and I'm glad uh, to come back when, whenever the committee is uh, hearing other witnesses, if I can be of assistance. But um, with that other change, uh, as I said, to uh, extending temporary orders, or at least their validity, uh, consistent with 610, we would favor. Um, I would just be very careful about tweaking the system. Um, right now, because it seems to be working. Sorry, Selena. Um, Zen Coburn, yeah. I think we, it's good. It's really good to hear that this is working in a timely way and that, um, that these proceedings can continue. And I deeply appreciate the all the ways it sounds like the judiciary is adapting and prioritizing um, these hearings. We did hear testimony and it might have been from legal aid, I'm trying to recall, um, I think it was in this committee about some 
instances, and perhaps this was earlier on, where some folks had tried to uh, participate remotely and were told they had to present in person for these hearings. Um, is it is it true that at each courthouse now the that option to participate remotely is has that is that consistent across all 14 counties at this point? Let me just say that at the beginning of, of this emergency period, um, everybody was finding their own way. Um, and there is no question uh, that the preference for any judge would be to have the parties in court for some of the reasons I've just explained that cross-examination, seeing exhibits, admission, admission of exhibits is extremely difficult. So I'm certainly not going to say that initially um, some judges may have said, look, uh, there are rules for telephone participation. And so you've got to file a motion. And to the extent that uh, I think that I've been able to convey the message, it is, look, th these are different times, different circumstances. We have to accept the fact that some people just are afraid to come to court. Um, they may be exhibiting symptoms that they don't want to come to court and potentially expose other people. Um, it, there may be any number of reasons. And so uh, we've tried to, as I said, be extremely liberal in accommodating those requests, um, knowing that it is not, you know, uh, perhaps the, the most, the best way for these proceedings to run. But I think with everything going on, um, we seem to be able to get through these and people get heard and, um, and, and decisions are made. And um, so certainly at the beginning, it's a struggle. I'm not going to tell you that there might be hiccups now and then, uh, but uh, I, I think it's working. Um, and that's not to say that I, I didn't hear the other testimony. The, you know, folks uh, on the other side may have seen things that I'm not aware of. And that's why I'm glad to come back and address those issues if necessary. But um, I'm sure there were problems at the beginning and we're getting better at it. Let's put it that way. I like to think we are. I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Judge Grierson. Uh, so to get back to more what testimony we need on uh, S114, Committee. So far on my list, I have a DMV on section five, uh, subsection three. Um, I thought perhaps the ACLU. Um, I don't think they, I'm pretty sure they did not testify on this uh, in the Senate Judiciary, but regardless, I think it would be helpful on this, um, the sections that, especially um, section uh, five, subsection two. Uh, Anybody else in terms of other witnesses? Uh, sure. I think it, um, I mean, if we really are considering um, amending that section, I think, um, like I said earlier, to me, it would be a public safety balancing test of like, okay, how, do, how what is the danger of having people on the road versus the danger of cutting people off from say food and healthcare at this time because they have no transportation. So I would, I think I would want to hear like from DPS about just um, highway safety, how they're handling DUIs right now and, and to be able to make that balancing test. But I think it depends how, like I also recognize if, you know, I think I would only want to hear that if we were really quite serious about thinking that we might forgo this because I think they're pretty, um, their time is pretty precious right now. Okay, anybody else? Sure, yeah. Yep, go ahead, yep. Barbara? I oh, okay, I wasn't oh, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm in a different square spot probably than you are. Um, so, I'm wondering about, I know we're hearing from Legal Aid about domestic violence stuff, but I'm wondering about hearing about them, about any of the um, driver's license or driver suspension issues and the expungement issues, since they've been quite involved with that. Um, sure, so tomorrow we are hearing from them, um, I think generally on this bill. So, okay. sure, yeah, okay. 
Does it make sense to hear from Tom at all at Vermont criminal justice? Reformers, like I don't know if they've been involved in any of this, but I don't, know. I don't, I don't think they have been because I think I'm we're really have been working off of the witnesses that Senate Judiciary had. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. And I spoke into Tom um, pretty recently, and um, you know, well, I'm sure he would welcome the opportunity to weigh in. I think a lot of their focus is on what's happening inside of corrections right now. They're doing a lot of work there. And we already talked about um, Terry, right? Related to the other section. Right, and so um, and I know you were in um, contact with her um, in terms of some of the other um, issues. And then we do have, I'm not sure everybody was on at the time, but we do have somebody coming in or um, appearing tomorrow on uh, section one and the uh, landlord concerns. Uh, so Terry provided a name for us. So I think that will be helpful and then we can reassess that section, whether or not we want to keep it in or whether or not we should see if, uh, if it's something that Senate economic development should, should take in their bill. So, okay. So uh, Madam Chair, yes. uh, in, rel in relation to section one, uh, I put a request out to uh, uh, the agency of uh, uh, commerce and community development, since they do the housing uh, and the financial uh, supports for that, uh, regarding Tom and Ken's question uh, for the uh, what supports or what eligibility uh, might the uh, uh, be within the funding structure for landlords, uh, since uh, that uh, was a question that had come up before. Um, so hopefully we'll have that, you know, shortly. So at least we can share it so we'd all have that information because I would imagine we'll all be asked that question at some point, you know, or another, because uh, there are constituents as well. Uh, and then thanks Selena and Martin uh, for the DUI uh, question, uh, because that uh, is, is a very uh, broad, uh, you know, topic. So I think uh, even though there are uh, pressures on uh, DPS, it would be a good idea to hear uh, their perspective on that as well, um, because it is what it is. Thanks. All right, thank you. And I'll work with Mike to, uh, to get folks on, even though we have a little bit of time tomorrow, I'm not sure we can get people on such short notice when we would have otherwise been able to, but uh, it's certainly more challenging right now. So, but but if not, uh, certainly next week. So we are meeting tomorrow at twelve thirty. So thank you, thank you everybody, and uh, I guess we will go off off the record and take good care. <laughs>